um, thank you for coming, everybody. And um, we have uh, Sanithia here, right? Yes. Uh -huh. And tell me again where you're from. I, do, I forgot what state you were in. I'm in um, New Orleans, Louisiana. Louisiana, okay. So um, tell me a little bit. So I want to start off by um, just for you sharing your, your background and um, your education and kind of your path to where you are now and, of course, what you do. Okay, I'm a nurse anesthetist. Um, basically, it's an anesthesia nurse. Um, I started off, uh, you know, of course, I graduated from college, graduated from undergrad um, in 2002 or one. Um, and I became a nurse, a bachelor um, of science degree nurse. Um, from there, so to to be on the career path that I'm on, you have to become an RN first, a registered nurse. So I became a registered nurse first. You have to work in ICU, an intensive care unit, for um, two years. Uh, once you work in ICU for two years, you apply to um, a nurse anesthesia program. Get accepted to the program. The training and um, for that program takes about three years. And after you graduate, you are um, certified to provide anesthesia. As a nurse anesthetist, we provide anesthesia in almost every setting um, across the country. We're the, the, the main an anesthesia providers, meaning that we're the ones that actually sit, stay in the operating room with you the entire time and provide your anesthesia. We do work alongside anesthesiologists, which are anesthesia doctors, and we're the anesthesia nurses. So um, they kind of uh, rotate around, like in any setting, there may be 10 nurse anesthetists and two or three anesthesiologists and their job is just to supervise. Um, but we're the main ones giving direct care um, for just about any type of surgery procedure you can have. And then what is the main difference between a doctor, like a, an anesthesiologist doctor and a nurse? And what are, yeah, what are the restrictions? Basically, the, 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 the main difference um, is the training as far as um, they, they are a physician and we are a nurse. So instead of, um, so we don't go to medical school. So we still get the same anesthesia training. So um, for a nurse and this like I said, you graduate. Um, a full year degree and become a nurse and then you do ICU training for two years and then you go to anesthesia school. Uh, anesthesiologists, they um, finish a full year college in whatever degree, they go to medical school and then they do the anesthesia training. The training, the three year training is the same for anesthesia, uh, whether you're an anesthesiologist or a nurse anesthetist. So the main difference is that they are a doctor, we're a nurse, but we almost 99% of the time do the exact same thing. Um, the biggest perks of them being a doctor is that they're a doctor and they actually uh, probably make twice as much as what we make. So I was looking at the, the Bureau of Labor and Statistics and it looks like the rural areas pay actually the most. Um, looking at from 2019 um, in the Los Angeles area, nurse anesthetists made about $100, $104 an hour um, and 217000 dollars a year. So that's actually more than some doctors make. Yeah. It it, it and it, it depends on where you work. I currently yes. make about one ten an hour. So um and that's um that's really good for a city, for a city job. Right. Um Depending on where you work, there are some rural areas of, of Texas to where they make maybe 200 an hour. Um, so yeah, we make probably um, more than a lot of, of some doctors like intern, internists and pediatricians, we probably make a lot of like a lot of, make more than a lot of doctors. Right. But anesthesiologists on the other mm -hmm. hand, um, you know, if we're making most, CR, most nurse anesthetists, we all, also called CRNAs, which stands for Certified Registered Nurse Anesthetist. Most of us um, probably make anywhere from 150 to 250 a year. And it's that I just probably make anywhere from 400 to 500 a year. Right. And again, they're going to medical school. They have a lot of debt and, you know, that kind of thing. So 
So did you? A little bit more debt. <laughs> yeah, a, a lot of debt, debt, debt. But they probably, I mean, yeah. And it's, yeah. Medical school is probably more than what I paid for anesthesia school, yeah. So they probably have more debt. Right. And did you go right through or did you take some time to be a registered nurse first? And then you have to work as a registered nurse first for two mm -hmm. years at least. Um, and so, yes, I did go straight through. That's a requirement. Once you become a registered nurse, you have to work in intensive care unit for, it depends on the area that you're in or what CR um, and a teacher program you're applying to. The minimum is one year, but some of them are two years. So the program that I applied to at the time, I had to work in ICU for two years. And um, I think I worked exactly two years and went straight back to, um, I applied and went straight back to anesthesia school. And um, that's it, I graduated maybe in 2007 from uh, nursing at this school. And how did you know that you wanted to be in, like what led you to believe that you'd like to have this particular career in medicine? Um, Actually, I really, when I was a senior in high school, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I had a lot of my high school teachers that were that were pushing me to become a doctor because they were just, they thought I was very bright and they said you should become a doctor. Um, I came, I was the first person in my family to ever graduate from college. So at, at that time, a doctor seemed so far-fetched to me. I didn't really have like a mentor or any type of um, anyone I can talk to or figure out, I, I didn't know what to do, honestly. So I had a friend of mine and she was like, oh, you should become a nurse like me. And I'm like, okay, that sounds cool. <laughs> so I pretty much, um, I didn't have any help with college. Like I pretty much went to college and applied on my own, did my own application, did all everything on my own, did my own, filled out my own financial aid, um, all that kind of stuff. And um, at the time that seemed like the, um most attainable career path for me and the easiest and the quickest and that's what I thought um once I became a nurse um I didn't feel that I was fulfilled like I didn't feel mentally like I was fulfilled in just that role as an ICU nurse I, I I wasn't being challenged mentally I felt like I wanted to do more so I started to research um different career paths I can go go to further uh, further further my nursing career um, I looked at nurse practitioner I looked at what I am now a nurse anesthetist I looked at just the one manager type of nursing um, just anything I can go and get a master's in nursing and what um, what um, you know goals I would like to have past a bachelor's degree in nursing so I went um, I was working at the time at the uh, VA hospital in New Orleans and I um, went to a nurse practitioner and I introduced myself and told her that I was thinking about becoming a nurse practitioner, but I wanted to follow or shadow her first to see what they exactly do, to see if it's something that I thought that I would be good at or something that I would enjoy. Um, I shadowed her and at first I was like, oh, well, I think I can do this. This, this sounds, you know, good. I applied for, um, uh, Loyola University's nurse practitioner program. I was accepted. In the meantime, um, I was working in ICU one day and we had a patient that um, stopped breathing. They coded. So we called for, um, we called the code and we had some anesthesia people come over and they, um, they intubated the patient, meaning that they put a breathing tube into the patient's trachea, into the patient's lung to breathe for them. And it did it so smooth and it made it look so easy. And I was like mesmerized. I was like, wow, like who are those people? And so some of my uh, coworkers who had been nurses longer than me, they kind of explained what they did. And I remember reading about them. Um, the career at the time wasn't as popular and I didn't really know much about it. So I didn't really look into it further after I read about it. But once I saw them in action, I just, at that point, I went to the operating room and I uh, approached one of them and I asked her if I can shadow her one day in the operating room. And she was like, yeah, yeah, sure. And I shadowed her for maybe two surgeries and I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. And then can you walk us through what a typical day is for to, in your position? Like what are the options? Um, what do you do? Yeah. So basically when, you know, I show up to work um, in a hospital, 
Um, so I have two jobs right now. I work in a hospital and I also work um, in an outpatient setting for a GI procedure and I'm sedated for like colonoscopies and EGDs. Um, I'll explain the surgery part, like the operating room, and I'll also explain the GI procedures, what I do for that. So when I show up to work in a hospital to, you know, if, if someone's having a gallbladder removed, for example, um, I first go into the operating room that I'm assigned to where that surgery is going to be, and I prepare my room and my anesthesia uh, machine. We have a machine that, that has a ventilator on it that breathes for the patient, um, it delivers the gases that keeps the patient asleep, and just prepare all my airway equipment and all my drugs and everything that I'm going to need for that day and also for that patient specifically. Um, so after I do that, that may take me around 15 minutes. We go to, um, there's a pre-op holding area where a patient goes when they first come to the hospital to have surgery. I introduce myself. Um, I look over the patient's medical history to see if there's anything that I need to um, do specifically for this patient based on their medical history. Like if someone has, you know, diabetes, I know I need to monitor their blood sugar during, during the surgery. Um, if they have a low blood count, depending on the surgery, if, if we may lose blood, I may I need I know I may need to have blood available to give them. Just different um, factors that I need to take into account. Someone ha has asthma, I know I need to listen to their lungs and make sure that they're not wheezing, possibly give them a, a, a butyrol treatment before the surgery. Um, just different things like that that I, that I know um, I need to look out for to make sure this patient goes to sleep safely and wakes up safely. So our job is to pretty much make sure this patient lives, make sure this patient goes to sleep, um, don't have any complications, make sure that they, um, you know, if anything arises, it's our job to save that patient's life and to wake them up safely and pain-free as much as we can. Um, so after I introduce myself to the patient, we have a consent that we sign, look over the patient's history. Once the operating room is ready, the nurse, the doctors, everybody's ready for the uh, surgery to start. It's my job to transport this patient from the uh, pre-op surgery area into surgery. As we're doing that, we give them a little medicine to help them relax, just to take the edge off because most patients are anxious. And once we get into the operating room, I have monitors that I attach to the patient that I use to monitor their vital signs, like I monitor their blood pressure, um, I monitor their oxygen saturation, which is how well they're breathing. We monitor their heart rhythm. Um, depends on how advanced the surgery is. There's other stuff that we monitor, but for basic surgery like uh, gallbladder removal, that's the basic stuff we may monitor. And um, you know, I go through my sequence of putting a patient to sleep, which is like giving them oxygen, giving them medication, they go to sleep, I put a breathing tube in, um, make sure they're sleeping, and you know, I give the doctor, the surgeons the okay to start once I think the patient is asleep and they start um, the surgery. During the surgery, I monitor the patient's vital signs. I monitor their, um, make sure they're, they're urinating properly because uh, we put a Foley catheter in a patient. I monitor their, um, their, um, uh, their fluids, meaning I have to give them IV fluids during the surgery to make sure they're hydrated, even though they're sleeping. We monitor their temperature. We have to keep them warm. So we have a warming blanket that we place on them while they're sleeping to make sure that they're warm while they're sleeping. Everything that you would do that your body does naturally, we have to make sure that we still do that during anesthesia because we take away that, uh, your body's ability to do that while you're under anesthesia. Um, once the surgery is over and the doctor has like placed the dressing on, then we go through the sequence of waking up um, some of the drugs, once we turn it off, they just wear off after a certain amount of minutes. Some stuff we have to reverse. And um, you wake up. Just, it, most people wake up naturally. Depending on the type of surgery um, the patient has, we give them um, pain medicine as they wake up. But depending on the type of surgery, you still will have some, some pain. Um, we make sure the patient isn't nauseous. We give them medicine for nausea. Um, and then at that, I drop them off to recovery room I, and I hand them off to recovery nurse. And upon handing them off, I make sure the vital signs are stable. I make sure they're as pain-free as, as, as I possibly can and make sure they're not vomiting or any type of complications as I hand them over to recovery nurse. And she takes over from there. And then I go and do the same thing for the next surgery. <laughs> so um, well, that's a long, so are you're, 
do you ever find that a patient wakes up? That's my night. My would be my nightmare to wake up. <laughs> <laughs> no, and that's most patients. That's most people's biggest concern, biggest fear. Um, I think that maybe happened like years ago. Like, I mean, I'm. I, I've been doing anesthesia. I'm 42. I've been doing anesthesia since I was 28. I've never had a patient wake up. I think um, with the advances in anesthesia and all type of technology now, I think that maybe happened when, you know, maybe in the 70s or, you know, before it was as advanced as, as it is. There's no way uh, or no reason that a patient can wake up um, and that, um, that I won't be able to recognize that they're... So, while they're under, under anesthesia, I have to, uh, I have to have the correct mixture, a, for, uh, a formula of m medications to keep them sleeping and keep them awake. I mean, keep them sleeping and keep them comfortable. So, I'm, so I have uh, medication that I'm giving the entire time while they're sleeping. Um, mm -hmm. If I don't do it correctly or if I don't time it right, there is there's a possibility that a patient can get what we call light, meaning that they may start to hurt a little bit. They're still sleeping, but they don't and they don't know they're hurting. But I know that they're hurting because the heart rate may go up, the blood pressure may go up a little bit. So then I give them more anesthetic. I, I give them more anesthesia. I give them more pain medicine. I adjust my anesthesia to get their vital signs. So your vital signs tell it all. This is is involuntary. Um, if someone um, you know, if, if you stump your finger right now, your heart rate's gonna go up. Like you can't control it. It's just a natural, you know, thing your body does. So I know long ahead of time, you know, that a patient's uncomfortable, or a patient may be hurting a little bit. Um, the only way a patient can wake up under anesthesia is if I just walked out the operating room for two hours and didn't give them anything. So other than that, there's no way that they won't be. Uh, won't wake up and I don't know it or, or I won't intervene in time. And then what's, how long are you in the operating room? I mean, you're, it seems like you're begin, the before, during, and after. How yeah, long I stay with the patient the entire time until they wake up and I give them to a recovery nurse. It depends on the surgery. Um, you have some surgeries that may be as, as, as quick as 10 minutes and some may be, as long as I've probably been in the surgery, it's like 12 hours. So how does that work? If you're constantly monitoring, are you ever able to leave and go take a break? Yeah, so um, like I say, in the, you know, in, on any given day, depending on where you work, um, there may be, depending on how big the operating room is, or uh, depending on the suite, I mean, not the room, the, um, the one hospital in Baton Rouge that I work at, um, that I travel once a month and go there, their operating room is huge. They may have 30 operating rooms. So on one day, we may have 50 nurse CRNAs or nurse anesthetists. So there's always someone available or anesthesiologists available if you need help, if you need assistance, if you need to take a break, if, you know. So um, if I'm in a 12-hour case, I may get, you know, at least five breaks. Okay. Is there a typical day? Like how many hours in a day do you work or does it depends on how many surgeries in a day or how? Um, it depends on, you know, what you're assigned to. You know, we do shift work. Um, most of the time I may work eight hours. I've worked as, as, as much as uh, 16 hours before. But typically it may be an eight hour day. And depending on what, what um, so every day you're assigned to a different um, like operating room. So if I'm assigned to um, an operating room with um, quicker cases or easier cases, I may do four surgeries in a day. If I'm assi assigned to um, operating room where we're doing brain surgery, I may do two a day. Some surgeries just take a lot longer than others, so it just depends on what my assignment is that day, how many um, surgeries I may do. Okay. But yeah, it just sounds like it's, so it sounds like it's just different every day you work. Yep, it's different every day. And, you know, with anything, um, you know, I have my favorite surgeries that I like and I have my surgeries that I don't like. I don't like to do uh, surgeries on ENT, uh, ear, nose, and throat surgeries, just because it's, um, 
you know, when you're taking somebody's tonsils out, there's bleeding in their airway. So it's just, it makes my job a little bit harder. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't want to deal with that. <laughs> but I also, um, just because I don't want to deal with the bleeding, the airway part, um, our job is to keep the patient bleeding and that complicates it more. But I love to do brain surgeries. I love to do heart surgery. So I can, I like to do the more complicated surgeries, but not just stuff that will complicate like the airway part of it, if that makes sense. I think that's what, and I think if you talk to any nurse and that this is, some may say, oh, I hate doing back surgeries or I hate doing, you know, heart surgeries. A lot of us hate doing uh, OB, like doing epidurals. I don't mind it, but a lot of, uh, a lot of people don't because they don't like to deal with the, uh, you know, pregnant patients whining a lot, I guess. <laughs> you say whining a lot? <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. I, I have three kids. Okay? So I, I kept that in mind when I was in labor. I'm like, okay, so don't whine because, you know, the notion that this is hate that. <laughs> so you are dealing with the patients before, while they're awake, you're talking to them and stuff like that before they even go in. Yes. Most patients don't remember that part. Um, we give them drugs to kind of, um, it's, and, and it causes a little amnesia from a certain point that, from, from the point that I give them a uh, Versed, which is like a, a Xanax type of drug, an anti-anxiety drug that, that has uh, some amnesia. So the point when I give them that, most patients, if you ever have surgery, you don't remember actually going into the operating room. You just remember meeting a person before and then waking up in recovery room. And it's because of uh, this drug that we give that causes amnesia. And do you have, and so how many days a week do you usually work? Um, right now I'm working five days a week, Monday through Friday, seven to three. I have worked in the past, um, you know, three or four days a week, but I've worked longer shifts. I've worked overnight shifts. I've worked evening shifts. I've worked weekends. But for right, right now, I'm just doing a Monday through Friday. I'm off every weekend. But it depends on where you work. I used to work at um, the Level 1 Trauma City uh, Center in New Orleans. And that, because it's a trauma center, it has to be staffed 24 hours. So when I work there, I work weekends, I work nights, I work evenings. My kids were younger and they're getting older now, so I'd rather be home. So I don't want to work, you know, the evening shifts and the night shifts and the weekend shifts anymore. And then I just got tired of, you know, five, six gunshot, you know, wounds every day. So was that what was that what you see in a, a level one trauma center? Is a lot of like here. In New Orleans, yeah, it depends on, on on the city that you work in and, you know, the crime. But when I was working at the Level 1 Trauma Center here, we had multiple gunshot wounds a day. Um, some stabs, not not as much stabs as gunshots. A lot of car accidents, um, depending on the, in the severity of the car accident, that patient is considered a, a Level 1 trauma. Um, and, you know, we have a few Level 2 trauma centers uh in the city also but it depends on the severity of the um i guess the um the wound or the the, the severity of like the, with the level one trauma center if someone is shot you know in the stomach or in in in, in their uh chest or anywhere where they have to be in surgery once e, once ent brings a patient emt brings a patient into the hospital we have a time from the time they get to the hospital to the time that we're actually in the operating room and the surgery starts of like 15 minutes because you have like a, a very short window to save that patient's life. Right, so are you kind of on call then and they just, or are you just on standby? During? We're always, yeah, we're, we're always in-house. Okay. When you're in the level trauma center, you, you staff 24 hours because right. if a trauma comes in, you don't have time to drive in. You, you, you literally have like five, 10 minutes to, to, to be in the operating room to put the patient to sleep. Okay. And then what's the difference between a level one and a level two trauma center? What, what it's just the, um, the uh, I think there's like regulations on what the hospital can do or um, you have to have certain, um, a certain things in your operating room, certain things in your ER, that certifies you to say that you are equipped to save this patient's life or you equipped to handle the severity of um of um you know of, of of surgeries or whatever so if someone gets shot you know 
one time in the arm, they don't have to come to a level one trauma center. They can go to a level two trauma center because it's not as acute. So it's based on the acuity and you having all the necessary equipment to save that patient's life and to do everything you need to do. If someone gets shot, you know, four times in the stomach, they're, they're, they have to go to a level one trauma center because you have a, short, a very short window to successfully save this person's life. Yeah. And then do you have any kind of stories to share about any, I guess, crazy, crazy stories? Hmm. Um, I guess I should have thought about that. Not really. I mean, I think my, um, not really. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, what's, what's your favorite? Like, what do you like the most about what you do? What do you, what, what do you like the most? I think for me, I like that is mentally challenging. Um, something can always go wrong under anesthesia. You can have the healthiest patient, um, athlete, and something can go wrong. Um, something underlying that you didn't even know the patient had can interfere with anesthesia. Um, something that the surgeon did accidentally can interfere. I feel uh, with anesthesia is is like you're never bored. You're, you're, from the time I pick the patient up to the time I drop them off after the surgery is over, I'm, te I'm steadily critically thinking about what to do next. And um, it's not just a, a plug and play thing. Like the, I'm, I'm constantly thinking of giving them more medicine or, you know, what can do this, doing this and doing that and thinking about what I'm going to do when it's time to wake them up. It's, it's very mentally challenging, stimulating for me. Uh, I like that part of it. I like um, just the satisfaction of a patient waking up successfully and um, and just, you know, pain-free and just, I, I guess, just ensuring that the patient had a, a, um, had a healthy and uh, successful surgery. Okay. And what about the the worst parts? What what are the things that you don't like about? Um, just, you know, when I, I, I haven't, outside of trauma, I've never had a patient die in surgery. Um, the worst part is when you can't save a patient. And that's only, for me, that's only happened to me during trauma. And that was because, like, there was nothing I could do to save that patient personally. You know, it was, it was, if someone shot 10 times and they're bleeding out everywhere, we're, we, we have these machines that we call um, rapid infusions, and we can give a, pint, uh, a unit of blood in 10 seconds. So as, as much as they're bleeding out, we're pumping blood in them. So cases like that, and, and sometimes it, it, it upsets you because it's, it's, it's a young kid. It can be a 14-year-old um, having to tell their, you know, parents or their loved ones that they did, that, that you couldn't save them. Um, that's probably the worst of it. If, um, you know, if, if I had to think of, like, the, the worst part of my job. Um, also, I work in, um, when I'm in at home, I do uh, a GI center. So I do anesthesia, I sedate patients for colonoscopies and what we call EGDs, which is upper endoscopies, where we look into their stomach and their esophagus. So we're, in essence, we're looking for um, massage treating people for like abdominal pain or diarrhea. We're also looking to diagnose cancers. So we diagnose a lot of colon cancers, esophageal cancers, and uh, stomach cancers. So that's hard. You know, because before the procedure, you get to know the patient, you know, even if it's a quick five minutes, you, you know, get to know them and they're nice and they're nervous. And then, you know, during the surgery or during the procedure, you find out they have cancer and then you, you have to wake them up and they're like, oh, thank you. You know, how do I do? And I can't tell them that they have cancer. I leave that to the GI doctor. But it's just knowing that, you know, someone has to deal with that. Just that's the, that's the sad part of the job. Yeah. That sounds like it. But do you, are you the one that has to tell um, the parents or family that their patient no. here is the doc, the doctor does that? The doctor does it. Yeah. Okay. But a lot of times, um, you know, I'll, I'll wake the patient up 
before I give them to the recovery nurse. So a lot of times they're asking me um, how they do or if they suspected they had cancer. They're like, I don't have cancer, right? And I'm like, oh, he's going to talk to you. You did great, you know, but it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be happy. I'm trying to smile and um, just fake it until, you know, they get the news. Um, once they get the news, I still have to go back and see them before they can leave. Like I have to discharge them saying that if the vitals are good, everything is perfect, they, they're okay to go home. And so I still have to encounter them after they've found out the bad news. So a lot of times they're crying and, you know, you just don't know what to say to them. Right. Yeah, that's hard. Um, I do want to mention that um, I know we have a lot of uh, sports therapy and sports medicine and other students in the in here. Um, if anyone has any questions, they could put it in the chat or feel free to speak up. Um, and I'll ask the question or you can ask the question. Um, but I do want to go back to education. Um, how long were when you were when you were a um, you did the BSN program? Yes. And then you had to go to the anesthesia program. How long is, can you just go right into the anesthesia program from, um, being, you said a two year, you said you- Once you, um, the BSN program, I graduated, um, I think in five years, it, it just depends on, like my first year of college, I kind of just, you know, goofed off. So, um, you know, after that one year of goofing off, I was like, okay, let me, you know, cause you have to take prerequisites. So when you first go to right. um, college for, uh, for nursing school, there may be a list of prerequisites that you have to take before you can apply to nursing school. So my first year of college, I kind of goofed off. I hung out with some, you know, a lot of my friends that uh, at the time they weren't in college. It was partying with them. And after my first year, I realized that, you know, I was behind. Um, so I had to, uh, I, re I repeated some of my prerequisites. So that took me about two years to finish my prerequisites. Once I completed those, I applied to the nursing program. It just depends on what college you go to. The college that I was at had also had a nursing program. If you don't go to a college for a nursing program, at that point, you have to apply um, to a different school. So you have some people that take their prerequisites at one college. And then they may transfer to a different school for the actual nursing program. But all in all, it's still about four to five years um, to become, to get a BSN in nursing. Um, once you get a BSN in nursing for anesthesia specifically, you have to work in ICU either one or two years, depending on what program you're applying to. Um, so the good thing about that is you get to work in ICU, you, you um, develop a lot of the basic fields that's going to help you become an, a, a nurse anesthetist. Um, stuff, you know, just, you know, how to take care of really, really sick patients. That's how you, you, you learn that in ICU. Um, and then you apply to the anesthesia program, which is another three years. Now that most anesthesia programs, uh, when I graduated, I graduated with a bachelor's in science and nursing with a specialization in anesthesia. Now, majority of the programs across the, across the countries are going to a doctorate program. So most nurse anesthetists now, they're graduating with a PhD mm. in uh, nurse anesthesia. So they're, they're a doctor, whatever, whatever, but not a medical doctor, but a PhD doctor in anesthesia. And I think, um, I don't think it lengthened the program. I think it may be, my program was 32 months. It may be 36 months now. And is, is that part of, like, is there like a classes that you have an internship as part of that or an externship with that program? Which one? The, B, the PhD with the, program? Uh, with the PhD program or with the anesthesia program? Um, yeah. So the entire time that you're in anesthesia school, you're actually training to, to become a nurse anesthetist. So you, you have a combination of, of, of classwork and clinical work. So when I was in school, we, we had lecture once a week on uh, whatever day, it may be a Monday or Tuesday, whatever, but once a week we had lectures and we may have, but we'll be in school all day that day, maybe from like eight to five. And then the other three or four days a week, we were, we were in the hospital training. Okay. And when we train, we train one-on-one -on -one with another nurse and ethicist who actually like teach us how to, you know, from start to finish. And then you go through different training um specialties like i make it trained in pediatric anesthesia 
maybe got trained in OB anesthesia. Like you get trained in each area over the course of three years. Okay. And um, what would you say, any kind of personality traits or skills that someone thinking about going to this field should really have? Um, not really. I, you know, I, the, the, the program, the anesthesia program is challenging. It's not an easy program. Um, and I mean, it, it, it makes sense that it's not easy because we are pretty much, you know, in charge of, of keeping a patient alive. So you need to have to, to be someone that's very vigilant, someone that, you know, just cares about people. I, I tell, I, I would tell students all the time when I was training, because when, when I worked at the trauma center, I trained students myself. Mm-hmm. And I would always tell them, you know, if it was a lady, you know, treat this patient as if she was your mom. You know, if, if, if you was handing over your mom to somebody to do anesthesia on, how would you want them to be treated? How would you want them to be cared for? So no goofing around, no, 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 no sneaking and looking at your phone. No, um, you know, during the bare minimum, you know, treat this patient like you would want to be treated or, or you would want your loved one to be treated. So just that type of personality because um, things can go wrong with anesthesia really, really quick. And you just have to be vigilant and pay attention and care enough to want the best outcome. Um, besides that, I, I can't really say um, like specific personality trait. I know when I trained, when I shadowed the nurse practitioner, um, it just didn't jump out at me. Um, like the anesthesia part of it did. And I think for me it was more of the critical thinking part of it was more intense for anesthesia. So I I will recommend anyone, um, if you're a high school student, you know, getting close to graduating and going to college, if you can just ask around different people, if you know anybody that's a nurse, you know, if you can go find them in a hospital one day, just to see what nurses uh, do. The good thing about nursing, if anyone's considering being a nurse, is that you can be um so many different types of nurses nurses uh work in so many different areas you can be a pediatric nurse an ob nurse you can be a psychiatric nurse you can be an er nurse you can be an operating room nurse you could be a nurse in a doctor's office there's so many different areas of nursing that you can be um that you can specialize in so if you don't like an ob nurse you can say okay well i'll just go work in the emergency room like you can that's going to be something that you're going to like um, and then a good thing about nursing is that you can further your, nur- your nursing career and go on to get a master's or a PhD and make really, really good money. Right. Yeah. And I know somebody had said, um, one of the students had said, how can we get experience right now on this pathway? But, you know, being in high school, um, as a junior or senior, it's a little difficult because I know that, you know, there are some internship programs, unfortunately with the COVID um, they're gone to virtual, and I will send Mr. White out and any other students who would like it um, that there is an immersion program, like a virtual program with speakers and um, that kind of stuff going on and, and exposure to different types of medicine. Um, so I'll send that out. But yeah, what can somebody do if they're really interested right now? Because it is hard to get in the door. It's hard to like, you know, hey, can I observe your surgery, you know? Or Yeah, um, yeah. Um... The best thing I can, you know, I can suggest if you know, and I mean, and no, you, you may not know anyone, but if you know someone that's a nurse, um, you can, you know, ask that person or, you know, ask the, a family friend or someone if they can al- allow you to come in and shadow them for a day. Um, I'm not sure if any of the hospitals do programs for um, high school kids to come in and shadow, like, as a whole, um, or not um there is there is in here just right now because of the covid but there are several actually um okay through um ucla and um through cedar sinai and children's hospital and that kind of thing there is but it's competitive just yeah. like anything else you know so but i can um again i have to look into see what happened with the their volunteer programs not really necessarily shadow but volunteer at the hospital right and that's closure 
Yeah, that's mm-hmm. a good way to get in also, just to see if you can volunteer in a hospital. And once you volunteer in a hospital, you may volunteer in a certain area and do things that you're not even around a patient. But once you're in the hospital and you see a nurse or you see anyone, then you can say, oh, hey, I'm such and such. I volunteer in this area. Do you mind if I, you know, come to your area and watch what you do one day? It's all about being assertive and in, and you know going after it and because it, you pretty much have to you know just be aggressive that's what i'm saying and and and, and try to find ways to, to to get the exposure but volunteering will be a, a good way to get in the door and once you're already in the door you have your badge they're not going to tell you no um like they would just you know to someone else who who's um not already credentialed to be in the hospital would you say so? You would just say that volunteering definitely would be a good. Uh, I think that'd be a, yeah. I think that'd be a big step just to get in the door. Even if you're volunteering, you're on a unit to where you're just filing, but you're in the hospital itself. You're gonna encounter nurses in your area or somewhere, um, or someone else may be able to in your area may be able to talk to a nurse for you. But yes, I definitely think um, volunteering, if you can't get an internship as a high school kid, um, volunteering would be a definite way. And I don't see any nurse telling you no. I know I don't, you know, kids come to me all the time and, um, you know, ask if I can talk to them or they can, you know, come and watch what I do. Of course you have to get permission from the hospital administration or like the unit manager or something like that. Um, and it's never an issue. It's never a problem. Okay. And how competitive is it? Is it competitive? Your your career is it was it hard to get into, or was it once you have the education and experience? It, no, it's it's very competitive. Um, I applied to um, LSU's uh, nurse anesthesia program, and at the time I applied, I had a million people telling me that I wasn't going to get in on my first try. That it was going to take me at least three or four tries before I got in, and I got in on my first try. So, um, you know, I say that to say it's competitive, but um, don't worry about that. You know, just have, make sure you have all of your requirements. Make sure you um, – so some of the requirements are besides having a Bachelor of Science in Nursing, you have to have a certain GPA from your nursing program. Um, and then we had to take, I think at the time, maybe the GRE, like the Graduate uh, Entrance Exam. I'm not sure what they are requiring now. Um, that was in 2004 when I got into the program. But um, I know that it's some form of like graduate entrance exam, GPA, and just your work experience. They're very, very big on work experience. So me knowing that I made sure that I was in a really, really good ICU that had really, what I was doing, recovering ICU patients from major surgeries and very, very sick patients. So um, I pretty much just sold myself during the interview. You know, I was like, you know, this is my GPA. This is what I've been doing the last two years. These are the type of patients I've been treating and caring for. Um, So it's competitive. um, But I tell everybody it's it's, it's doable. And as long as you have your requirements and as long as you um, have everything, don't have the, the minimum. You know, if, if the minimum is a 3.0 GPA, I will make sure I have at least a 3.5 GPA, um, you know, just so that you want to be, you know, looked at as an asset coming to the program. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you before about, is there a lot of, when you do, when you're monitoring the anesthesia, do you have to do a lot of math? Is there a lot of figuring out formulas and that kind of thing? Um. Not continuously. There is some math involved. Um, there are some math involved with, um, okay, so in pediatric anesthesia, it's, it's, it's a lot of math involved. With pediatric, um, you know, you know, if you have kids, you know when you give them Tylenol, you have to measure it based on their age and their weight. Not so much for adults, right? Most medications for adults say 12 and older. So for, I do mainly adult anesthesia. So for adult anesthesia, it's more of a a range. Um, And when I say range, I may 
I may give the same dosage of anesthesia to someone who's 150 pounds versus someone who's 200 pounds. Um, you have to take into consideration age. I won't give, so if so, if as a, I'll give an 18 year old more than I would give an 80 year old, of course. But uh, the, the mat is more involved with pediatric anesthesia because you have to give everything based on a weight. So it's, it's, it's a different amount of medication you give for someone who's 25 pounds versus someone who's 50 pounds. Um, everything for a child is like weight-based. You're calculating. Every time you give a child medication, you're calculating first how much you give them based on their weight versus, like I said, with adults, it's, it's more of a range. I can kind of just look at an adult um, and, and, and gauge how much I'm going to give. Okay, that makes sense. Well, that's good to know because I was thinking. Was so if you're not good at math, you can still be a nurse. Not this is going to say that because I I suck I still suck at math. <laughs> okay, I yeah. Well, I'm sure. I use my fingers all the time. I use my calculator, but I also don't do pediatric a lot either, and that's probably one of the reasons I hate pediatric because I hate having to calculate everything. Okay, well I know that in general for medicine you have to just be good at math and science. That's just going into programs and the prerequisites and you know when you're taking anatomy and biology and chemistry and all that stuff so. yeah it's, it's 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 not it's not very detailed mad it's, it's some mad just basic you know drug calculations if you can calculate you know you know basic drug calculations and you use the killer you know you convert from pounds to kilograms and using that to figure out you know how many milligrams to give but it's it's, it's not hard mad at all like i say i Matt was my always my weakest subject. Okay, that's good to know. That's encouraging. Mm. Some people are better than others. Um, yeah, but you, you know, science is a big one. You kind of have to like science. You kind of have to not be afraid of blood and, <laughs> and everything. Um, you know, most kids are like, "Oh, I hate blood." I don't think. You know, I mean, I, I've I've seen this inside of you know people's brains, inside your heart. You know, you have you kind of have to. You know, and, and not to say that just because you don't like it now and that you may not develop a, you know, a liking for it. Not a liking, but it, it doesn't bother you. So, you know, I have, I have a daughter now who's in college and she wants to be a doctor, but she's like, oh, my God, I hate blood. I'm like, okay, so at some point you have to get over that. <laughs> Is there a lot of that? I mean, what, what as far as we're looking at the TV shows and surgeries and stuff, is it? Anything like that, or is there a lot of blood and guts involved? And blood, There's a lot of blood and guts. It, it yeah. is, um, but it's not. Um, most of the TV stuff is so far fetched. Just, I guess, the specific stuff. Like if I watch Grey's Anatomy, a lot of stuff they do wrong. I'm like, that's not right. But just because I know the difference, um, I mean. But you know, you get the the the, the gist of it. And it, depending on what type of area you work in, is is more you know blood and guts than others. You know, some some of it is just a little blood. Some of it, you know, is a lot. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, it it doesn't bother you eventually. Like I mean, <clears throat> I can, you know, I can look at someone's brain or heart and then you know eat a Snicker afterwards. Like it doesn't upset me at all. <laughs> or eat a Snicker while I'm looking at it. <laughs> right. Well, that's good. Uh, well, if there's any, is there any other questions? Anybody? Feel free. Um, but yeah, you've been, it's, well, that was a lot of information and it kind of dispels the myth. I mean, it's a great, sounds like a great career to have. It is. Yeah. Um, it's a, a job security and, you know, you always, someone's always going to need surgery. We make really good money. You, you know, you can have a really good lifestyle and it's doable. It's, it's hard, but it's doable. Right, and your schedule Monday through Friday, seven to three. That's awesome. Yep. Weekends <laughs> off and nights yep, and holidays. Weekends, holidays. Yep. Yeah. Um, and okay, and right now you're doing mostly elective. Is it elective surgeries or just? That's yeah, I'm mainly doing elective okay. procedures right now. Okay. I'm mainly doing um, um, you know, we have some urgent stuff that we do, but I'm mainly doing um, you know, screening colonoscopies and stuff like that. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Appreciate it. And oh, no problem. If anyone, you know, needs any help with nursing or have any questions, they can reach me. 
um, email, phone, whatever, and I can help them. Um, you know, if anyone just wants to become a nurse or wants to, you know, think about nursing isn't it for everybody, but you can do so much more than nursing. Right. And this is, yeah, this is one of, we never had a nurse anesthetist before. So, um, but there's just so many different fields within the field of nursing. So different. Yes. So, all right. I will share your email with Mr. White, the instructor who's in, um, right now and, and, um, you can get it out to the students if they have questions. Okay. Perfect. Right. Thank y'all. Thank Good you luck, so everybody. much. All okay. right. Bye. Bye. Bye.